Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Catholic Theological Union. I'm Sister Barbara Reed, president of CTU, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Holocaust Remembrance Lecture. For those of you who may be new to CTU, we were founded in 1968 in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, and we have been very committed since our founding to interreligious dialogue, especially through our Catholic Jewish Studies and Catholic Muslim Studies programs. Under the leadership of Father John Polakowski and Rabbi Chaim Perlmuter of Blessed Memory, two of our founding faculty members, the Catholic Jewish Studies program became a hallmark of CTU, and we treasure the deep and lasting friendships that have been formed between CTU and our Jewish partners in the last five decades and more. In 2001, CTU established a chair in Jewish studies made possible by a most generous gift of Lester and Renee Crown and Patrick and Shirley Ryan, which has been held since 2014 by Dr. Malka Zeiger Simkovich, along with her directorship of the Catholic Jewish Studies Program. Dr. Simkovich holds an MA in Hebrew Bible from Harvard University and a BA in Bible Studies and Music Theory from Stern College of Yeshiva University. She earned her PhD in Second Temple Judaism from Brandeis University. In May 2019, Malka initiated the Holocaust Remembrance at CTU, which includes three components, a lecture on the background of the Holocaust, which we have tonight, Secondly, an in-person visit to the Illinois Holocaust Museum and a talk by, given by a Holocaust survivor with question and answer. Malka will say more about these opportunities, but I invite you to visit our website at ctu.edu for more information and to register for these events. I ask Malka now to introduce our esteemed lecturer who is a longtime friend of CTU and who actually introduced Malka to us, Rabbi Yehiel Pupko. Thank you so much, Sister Barbara. Good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Malka Zeiger Simkovich, and I would like to thank you all for joining us at this evening's lecture, the first of three events, as Sister Barbara said, which comprise our annual Holocaust education series that takes place every May. This evening's talk, Some Perspectives on the Destruction of European Jewry, will be delivered by Rabbi Yechiel Pupko, rabbinic scholar at the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago. Among his many responsibilities, Rabbi Pupko represents the Chicago Jewish community in its relationships with many national Christian organizations in the Catholic Church, the mainline Protestant denominations, and the evangelical community. He is the author of a book about the, about the figure of Hannah in rabbinic literature and liturgy. And his poetry has been published in the Christian Century, among many other forums. Anyone who knows Rabbi Pupko also knows how important he is to the CTU community and that he has had a decades long friendship with Sister Barbara Reed, Father Mark Francis, Father John Polakowski, and my predecessor, Rabbi David Sandmel. Besides championing Jewish Catholic relations internationally, Rabbi Pupko has been a crucial supporter of our Catholic Jewish Studies program, and we are honored to welcome him here tonight. We will leave time at the end for discussion, so please reserve your questions for the end of the hour, at which time we will invite you to use the hand raise feature or put your questions or comments into the chat. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rabbi Pupko. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sister Barbara Reed. Uh, it's always wonderful to be the beneficiary of your wise hospitality. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Malka Simchevich. Um, it is really indeed humbling to be uh, put into play and told what to do by great scholars who are younger than most of your children. Um, and in fact, Malka is an example of a great phenomenon in American Jewish life. We have raised up, thankfully, a wonderful cadre of young Jewish scholars. Um, before I begin, uh, as I have been doing for the past two weeks, uh, when I'm ever I'm with uh, Christian friends and Jewish friends, uh, one of the uh, great uh, men of the Catholic Church died 
a little more than two weeks ago. My dear friend, Father Thomas Bema. Uh, Tom was provost at Mundelein at St. Mary of the Lake Seminary. And um, I would say even more importantly, he was uh, for the Archdiocese of Chicago, a vicar for, in, for ecumenical and interreligious affairs. Um, Tom was a very great man, uh, possessed not only of a deep understanding uh, of Catholicism and Christianity, but of a profound understanding of Judaism and Catholic Jewish relations. Uh, all of us who knew him uh, will only grow to miss him ever more as the days go by. Um, so uh, this is uh, in the Jewish calendar, uh, the season uh, of, uh, frankly, redemption and destruction. Uh, the season uh, began on Purim. Uh, Purim takes place, which is recorded in the book of Esther. Purim takes place at the full of the moon, uh, which means the 14th and 15th of the Hebrew month, exactly four weeks uh, before uh, the full of the moon uh, of the spring month, uh, which brings with it uh, Passover, Holy Week, Good Friday, and Easter. Uh, Purim and Passover uh, share many things in common. Um, in both instances, uh, there is a Jew high at court, uh, Mordecai and Esther on Purim, and uh, Moses in the Pharaonic Fer palace. In both instances, the Jews are threatened uh, with annihilation. Uh, Haman is the first one to imagine genocide. In the ancient world, people didn't commit genocide. If one army defeated another army, it took everyone home that it captured as slaves. They intermarried in a few generations. They were ruling that country. Uh, just talk to the Assyrians, Babylonians, Greeks, and Persians. They'll tell you all about it. But Haman uh, said something that no other ancient said. Uh, he said, you know, let's just wipe out all the Jewish people. And it meant so much to him, he was willing to pay for it. Um, but there is one big difference. In the book of Esther, there's one critical figure whose name is not mentioned, and that's the name of God. God is absent in the book. Mordechai and Esther, by their wit uh, and wiles, must save the Jewish people, and they do that. On Passover, the book that retells uh, the story of the exodus from Egypt uh, that Jews uh, the world over read and celebrate at the Seder, the Passover meal. Um, there's one name missing from the narrative of the exodus uh, from Egypt, and that's the name of Moses, which is sort of like reading Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet without mentioning Romeo's name. Moses is not mentioned. And yet, these two, Purim and Passover, are but four weeks apart. What's the message in this? Purim precedes Passover by four weeks to send a very simple message to the Jewish people. Passover is the first and only time until the end of days when God will intervene radically in history. Uh, and break through into our time and space with the 10 plagues and with the splitting of the sea uh, in order to save the Jewish people. But once we are redeemed from slavery in Egypt, we are not redeemed to live in a perfect world, quite the opposite. We are redeemed in order to continue to redeem the world. And uh, therefore the message of Purim is clear. God will save us from the hands of Pharaoh and Mordechai and Esther will save us from Haman's evil designs. And not too long after Passover, we come to that day set aside, the 26th day of Nisan, just a few days after the conclusion of Passover, when we remember the destruction of European Jewry 
And we tell that tale in pretty much the same way, year in and year out, just as we tell the tale of the Exodus in the same way for the past 2,000 years. And so let's begin with some simple understandings. Let's begin with words. Uh, the standard term for the destruction of European Jewry is Holocaust, a word found for the first time in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible going back 2,200 years. It is the Hebrew word for an animal offering found for the first time in the first chapter of Leviticus. It is Greek. It's for an offering that was whole burnt, holocaust. Well, the destruction of European Jewry though whole burnt, was hardly an offering. Another term is the Yiddish term that comes from the Hebrew term for the destruction of the temple, the chobm, uh, the desolation, the destruction. But that term leaves something to be desired because the destruction of the temple in the year 70 and the partial exile of the Jewish people from the land of Israel uh, was not part of a Roman plan to annihilate the Jewish people. The current Hebrew term um, memorialized by the government of Israel when it established Holocaust Memorial Day more than a half century ago in the early 50s is Shoah. Shoah is a word found in the Hebrew Bible. It's not found that many times. It refers to an enormously destructive storm. However, in each instance in which that term is found, it is a surprise. It is a whirlwind that falls out of the heavens without any war, without any warning. The destruction of European Jewry um, did not emerge suddenly and indeed unanticipated. And therefore, I like the descriptive term. I prefer the descriptive term, the destruction of European Jewry. Destruction means after which nothing is left. Now, there is an important perspective on the destruction of European Jewry uh, that is especially poignant this year with um, the um, invasion uh, by Vladimir Putin's army of uh, Ukraine. Um, and um, I uh, must tell you uh, that uh, I follow um, uh, Jesus in Mark 5, uh, who casts a demon named Legion uh, into uh, a herd of swine. And the swine or the boar was the emblem of the Roman legion. And then you all know that uh, that herd of swine uh, is driven off the cliff and into the Sea of Galilee and drowns. And what Jesus is saying in the version in Mark 5 is uh, that God ought to do to the Roman legion what God did to Pharaoh. Um, I do indeed hope uh, and pray uh, that God provide the Ukrainian soldiers and citizens with all that they need uh, to defeat uh, this evil army. And I do in fact hope uh, and pray that God would do to Putin what God did to Pharaoh. Now, I mentioned Ukraine because it has brought to our attention especially through a recent book published just a few months ago by Jeffrey Weidlinger um, of the University of Michigan, uh, something remarkable. We Jewish people have walked the geography of Ukraine for a thousand years. And all those little godforsaken towns that you hear in the news uh, today, such as Makarov, the first suburb, to be liberated from the Russians by the Ukrainian fighters. That's an example of a town that none of you ever heard of, but it was in the news going back about three or four weeks. That time town was really exciting for my family and me because my great grandfathers going back seven generations were rabbis in that town. 
Who ever heard of Makarov? And Putin's invasion put it back on the map. But now, let's follow Jeffrey Weidlinger, who teaches us something remarkable. Between 1919 and 1921, in the Ukrainian national uprising, which took place in the wake of the Russian Civil War and as part of an attempt to establish an independent Ukrainian uh, state, approximately 100,000 Jews were murdered in more than 1,000 pogroms that took place throughout central and western uh, Ukraine. Uh, amongst those 100,000 was my mother's father's first wife and two of his three children. These pogroms um, were, um, were lethal, they were highly participatory, and they were quite familiar uh, to everyone there. A pogrom can best be appreciated and apprehended by Americans who know something about lynchings. The lynching of nearly 5,000 African Americans had a participatory, celebratory, and almost religious-like nature to it. These were public events. Lynchings in the main did not take place in private. Now the Germans invaded um, the Soviet Union, invaded the Ukraine on uh, June the 22nd, 1941. When the Germans did this, they broke the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, uh, which uh, had enabled the Germans to fight a war only on the Western Front. And uh, the Soviets were only happy to sign it in August of 1939. And it brought about the partition of Poland and uh, the Soviet invasion soon to follow of the Baltics and uh, Western parts of what is now Belarus and Ukraine. Just two days after June 22, 1941, on June the 24th, 1941, began what is now called the Holocaust of Bullets. Approximately 1.4 million Ukrainian Jews were murdered by not just the mobile killing units, but by mass collaboration on the part of uh, Ukrainians. Weidlinger has shown something very important, that the pogroms of the Ukrainian national uprising in 1919, in which 100,000 Jews were murdered, acculturated the Ukrainian citizenry to violence against Jews. When 100,000 people are murdered, over a period of a year and a half, 1919 into 1921, over a significant portion of a country, in village after village, in city after city, without direction from a central authority, but as a popular event, people become acculturated to violence against Jews. Indeed, the Germans make mention of this and call upon the mobile killing units to take advantage of this Ukrainian hostility towards the Jewish people, towards their acculturation to the violence of the two, two decades um, earlier. This is known as the Holocaust of bullets because the overwhelming majority, almost all the one, ultimately 1 1.4 million Jews who were murdered were not murdered in a systematic way in death camps. They were murdered up close and personal uh, with deep intimacy between the murderers, mostly Ukrainians, and uh, the German mobile killing units. I should not go any further, however, without noting that today there are 40 million Ukrainians, 200,000 of them are Jewish, and the Pew study has recently demonstrated that of all the countries in Eastern and Central Europe, Ukraine has the lowest level of hostility to the Jewish people. For example, 
of democratic Lithuania's citizens do not believe Jews should be entitled to citizenship in democratic Lithuania today. In Ukraine, it is the lowest. Only 5% of Ukrainians do not believe Jews should be entitled to citizenship. And indeed, you know well that there is a proud Jew, uh, Zelensky, who is now president of Ukraine. So between the murder of 1.4 million Ukrainian Jews with significant Ukrainian collaboration and the past 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, a vast change has overtaken Ukrainian attitudes to the Jewish people. This first stage of the destruction of European Jewry um, is when the murderers came to the murdered and murdered them uh, with the help and cooperation of their neighbors and friends and murdered them where they lived on a line running from Estonia on the Baltic Sea in the north, uh, all the way down uh, to Southern Ukraine uh, and the Black Sea. When the Germans realized what a messy operation this was, uh, they knew that uh, they had to change. And so they went to the famous conference on January the 20th, uh, 1942 in a lovely chalet outside Berlin and at Grossam Wannsee, they did not make the decision to destroy European Jewry. That decision had already been made. They made the decisions there how to implement it administratively and all the good administrators were present. We even have the lunch menu for the meeting. And in the second stage, uh, the uh, uh, Operation Reinhardt camps that were secreted away in uh, the forests uh, of Poland. They were uh, Treblinka, Belzitz, uh, and Sobibor. Approximately 1.8 million Jews were murdered. And uh, there were no barracks in these camps. These were not labor camps. Uh, the Jews came and uh, they left, so to speak, uh, through uh, the chimneys. Um, but by the time the systematic destruction of Polish Jewry in these three camps began that murdered 1.8 million Jews, fully one quarter of the six million Jews were murdered on Soviet territory with heavy local collaboration. And by the way, uh, it should never be forgotten uh, that it is a Catholic priest, Father Desbois of France, who has made it his life task to identify the mass murder sites, hundreds upon hundreds of Jews murdered in Ukraine. So in the second stage, the Operation Reinhardt camps, uh, Treblinka, Belzhitz, Sobibor, approximately 1.7 million Jews were murdered. And that process was completed by early 1943. The Germans then began to look southward and they realized something. There were, after all of this uh, uh, destruction, uh, there were approximately 800,000 Jews left in Hungary alive and approximately 350 to 400,000 in Romania. This brought about the third stage in the destruction process. Auschwitz, the mass killing center. And uh, approximately uh, 1.1 uh, million Jews uh, were murdered uh, in uh, Auschwitz. Now, it is very important for Catholics to appreciate three papal visits uh, to Auschwitz. Um, I, I apologize for being self serving. Uh, but I wrote an essay about this in a recent number of the National Catholic Reporter. When John Paul II in 1979, six months after uh, becoming Pope, uh, went to Poland, uh, he uh, went to Auschwitz. And in 1979, he did something absolutely necessary and bold. He said that the victims in Auschwitz were Jews. 
the communists didn't permit that because for the communists, it was not Jews who were murdered. It was the proletariat of the world that was murdered by Western fascist capitalists. John Paul bravely identified the victim in 1979. It was the Jewish people. In 2006, uh, Benedict went to Auschwitz and he did something utterly and equally remarkable. Where John Paul II identified the, and named the victim, Benedict identified and named the sin. Benedict said this was not just a genocide. Benedict said this was a deicide, the killing of God, the murder of God, if one dares say it. Why? Benedict said, because God dwells in the midst of Israel, in the midst of the Jewish people, and the Germans believed that if they murdered the Jewish people, they could murder the presence of God in this world. So the second pope to make pilgrimage to Auschwitz identified and defined the sin, not just genocide, but deicide. The third pope to visit Auschwitz, obviously, was Francis. And he did something absolutely stunning. You know what he did? He did nothing. In other words, let me explain. You know, when a pope travels, uh, half the population of the state of Illinois travels with him. He doesn't go anywhere alone. But the whole retinue, his staff, uh, the Polish Catholic Church, the diplomatic corps, you name them, the Polish government, he bade them farewell, so to speak. He had them stop where they were in Auschwitz, and he went off a few hundred feet to do nothing, to sit by himself in silence. He didn't say a word. What was Pope Francis saying? He was saying enough words spoken in this place. If we are silent, we will be able to hear the voices of those who were murdered here. John Paul II named the victim. Benedict named the sin. And Francis, in his silence, raised up the proper commemoration. Now, the destruction of European Jewry was surely a very great crisis for the Jewish people, unspeakable. It was an equally great crisis for Christianity and for Western civilization. For Western civilization, it was a crisis because Western civilization is built on the, is built on the Socratic notion that virtue and knowledge are synonymous, that if you have knowledge and learning and education and culture, you will be a virtuous or good person. Well, when uh, the world's greatest center of science, technology, humanities, and the arts perpetrated uh, the destruction of European Jewry, uh, that put lie to the notion that uh, educated uh, people are by definition virtuous people. That question has not yet been addressed. How will Western civilization respond to the erasure of the Socratic notion that virtue and knowledge are synonymous. This created a very great crisis for Christianity. This is a crisis which the Roman Catholic Church has responded to uh, with greater depth um, and greater pain and greater remorse um, and greater repentance than any other uh, Christian church uh, or denomination. And people my age have been able to witness this process uh, unfolding step by step through the 1950s, the 1960s, Vatican II. I'm not going to trace all the steps. There are scholars who work with Sister Barbara and Malka at CTU who can lay this out far better than I can especially the magisterior father, John Pawlikowski, known to Americans as John Pawlikowski. Um, and the church uh, looked very uh, hard at itself and at the classic tr Christian teaching of contempt, 
uh, for Judaism and the Jewish people uh, over 2000 years. Now to be sure, the Christian teaching of contempt for Judaism and the Jewish people, please listen carefully, was a necessary but remarkably insufficient condition for the destruction of European Jewry. It did set a fertile seedbed for the flourishing of what the Germans came and did. But it is a necessary but inadequate condition for the destruction of European Jewry. Furthermore, it has to be said uh, at times like this that the Roman Catholic Church is today uh, the best friend in the Christian world that the Jewish people and Judaism have. Um, and that Christians who live today are surely not guilty. Um, and in fact, uh, they are responsible only in the following sense. Uh, my family came to the United States in 1931. We were not slaveholders. We did not take place in Jim Crow. And we were on the right side of all civil rights activities. However, the moment I say, I am an American, I become responsible for all of American history, even though my family got here very, very late. Now, with your indulgence, um, and I guess that's kind of insincere because I know you're on the line, so, but it, with your indulgence, and I do appreciate it, I would like to read a few poems. Now, there's something inelegant about this because I happen to be the author of these poems. And the first poem I'd like to go to is not the first poem I chose that Peter has up there, but it's the second poem. Um, and um, I have a few poems to read before I open this up for questioning. Um, this poem, uh, and I'm willing to take uh, uh, questions about it, uh, this poem was published in the Christian Century, I think, and it was uh, just published in a book of poetry, uh, uh, in a book of my poetry. The title of the poem is Last Supper. My last full day, like any other, sunlight over the dark, prayer to the one, let there be light in Torah study, over and ever again his word, I am. For breakfast, who brings forth bread from the earth, smuggled through the wall, and labor to till and tend garden and factory, uniforms for the front, by the sweat of my brow, daily bread, this is my body, daily broken, for transport, via dolorous stations, to chimney and cross. The second poem I would like to read is entitled, Suffer the Little Children. To the ghettos, Warsaw, Vilna, Lodz, Lublin. Then little children were brought to Jesus, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel, for him to place his hand on them and pray for them, Avraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Yosef. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them, Miriam, Yochevet, Sipor, Elisheva. Jesus said, let the little Barak, Gideon, Shimshon, Shmuel children come to me, Yisachar, Zevulun, Gad Asher, and do not hinder them. Tirza, Batsheva, Hannah, Penina, for the kingdom of heaven, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Maidanik, Sobibor, belongs to such as these. Shlomo, Chizkiyahu, Yishayahu, Yirmiyahu, when he had placed his hands on them, Yentl Sosha Mindelish Prince, he went on from there. Belgitz Helmno Plash of Buchenwald, and the little children came. The word become ash. For a while we lived by the word, I am, you saw no image. I am the word unseen and heard, never to become flesh. All the seizing, all the heavens parchment each blade of grass a quill, each Jew a scribe. We died by the word. Before the deed was done, the word became flesh and the flesh became ash. We died by the word, just one word. I am Yude. And finally, beginning with the crucifixion. 
And we thought, all right, he's only one Jew. Let them have their just one Jew. Appetite satisfied with just one Jew, and that'll be it. Just one Jew and we'll be saved. And having had one just one Jew, appetite grew and grew for one more Jew, just another one more Jew to save us all. Just one Jew. The skulls grew and grew of just one more Jew. Heaps of skulls, no more Jews. Not ever just one more Jew. Thank you for listening to me. I will take uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much, Rabbi Pupko. What we can do, uh, because we're just a small intimate group of 98 participants, is we can invite people to put comments or questions in the chat, but also you can use the hand raise feature and um, I'll try to find you. Any comments, questions, remarks? Well, I'm happy to start the conversation, but I don't want uh, to dominate uh, over here. If someone does have a question, please feel free. Uh, Rabbi Pupko, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience in your writing poetry and how this started for you? What's the context for this very powerful poem? What instigated your, um, I know that you've written a lot of poetry and you're published, but where does this come from? Can you speak a little bit to us about that? Um. I was raised by my late mother on poetry, uh, both English poetry and the poetry of the Torah. Uh, the Hebrew Bible has lots of wonderful poetry. And then when I tried to learn about the destruction of European Jewry, I found that some of the greatest and most painful thinking about um, uh, the destruction of European jury was found in Yiddish poetry. The overwhelming majority, probably as many as 85% of the Jews murdered by the Germans, their native tongue was Yiddish. So that Yiddish was the language of the destruction of European jury. When Jews had to come up with words for gas chamber or crematoria or ashes, and all of their suffering, it was the Yiddish language that was altered by the destruction of European jury, just like as George Steiner pointed out, the German language was a language that lent, that gave hell a native tongue. Well, Yiddish gave the destruction of European jury a native tongue. And so I began to read a lot of Yiddish poetry and poets were able to say things to God and about God that just didn't work in prose, not at all. Uh, for example, the great Yiddish poet Yankel Gladstein, Jacob Gladstein in English, wrote a poem, Nish di Mesim Leuden Gott, the dead do not praise God. That's a quote from a verse from Psalms. And Gladstein takes that verse, translated into Yiddish, the dead do not praise God, and says, well, if the dead do not praise God and we are destroyed, who will be left in this world to praise you? Or you have the great woman Yiddish poet who actually lived in Detroit of all places, um, Kadya Maladovsky, who wrote a poem, Atov um, Chautonomi Kola Amin, you chose us from amongst all the nations. Gotten you, dear sweet God. For a little while, go choose another people. Um, and uh, Gladstein wrote another poem uh, that began uh, with a, a Yiddish translation of a quote from rabbinic uh, uh, literature. Uh, and it is... Um, on Eden, without Jews, and he goes on to say, on Eden, that nish sein can either shall got. Without Jews, there will be no Jewish God, which is exactly what Benedict said when he said this wasn't a, a, a genocide; it was a deicide. So, as uh, so, after having read a lot of this poetry, I somehow started to write poetry of my own. Um, 
I know some very great poets. I always tell my editor, Jill Baumgartner, she calls me a poet. I'm not a poet. I write poetry. She's a poet. John Donne is a poet. Louise Glick is a poet. Um, and they have a craft and they practice it with brilliance. Things fall into my head and I just write. Um, and one of the great uh, questions uh, that has that challenges me about the destruction of the Euro of, of European Jewry um, is what I have done in some of these poems is appropriated Christian symbols. And Jews began to do that in 1880. One of the first and most significant examples of that is right here in Chicago. The Art Institute has the original of Chagall's The White Crucifixion. In Chagall's The White Crucifixion, as he experiences the pogroms in the Russian Empire in 1881, 1882, he says, wait a minute, you've been telling us for 2,000 years we crucified Jesus of Nazareth. Take a look at who's been crucified now. And Jews began to appropriate Christian symbols and metaphors and say, you know, uh, we're the crucified people. And so in this poem, for example, The Last Supper, I imagine a Jew in the Warsaw Ghetto at his last supper. So that's sort of how it, it came to be. I wanna ask a question before we go to the chat and someone does have his hand raised. Uh, do we have your permission, Rabbi Pupko, to share this poetry that was uh, put up yes. on the screen? Oh, absolutely. So anybody, okay, so uh, maybe what we'll do is if anybody does want a copy of this uh, poetry, I would be very glad to, uh, to share. I, I'm not going to put it into the chat right now, but feel free to email me or you can email the Bernadine Center and we'll send you, uh, we'll, we'll swiftly share the document with you. So thank you very much. Um, I do want to go to a question that Carol Potter has put into the chat, a very uh, intriguing and important question. She wants to know, uh, to what do you attribute the improvement in modern attitudes towards Jews in Ukraine in particular, especially given the very, very dark history of Ukrainian anti-Judaism during the war and prior to it? So that is an amazing question. All sorts of scholars of East European politics and sociology have been asking that question in the past few months. I'm not a scholar of that field. Here is what here is here is what a, here are a variety of opinions. Um, one one opinion is, well, we're only two hundred thousand now uh, in a population of forty million. We don't quite matter. Another opinion is that uh, Jew hatred was heavily stoked and reinforced by Soviet communism. Uh, another uh, opinion, which I kind of like because I spend, I have until recently spent a lot of time in Ukraine, is this. For all its difficulties, there's corruption in the Ukrainian government. They are not well organized. We Americans have been frightfully naive and ignorant about what the Soviet system did to the human spirit in 74 years and what it takes to become a democracy. All that notwithstanding, the Ukrainians have thrown themselves in to the, to the project of building democracy since 1991. Um, uh, uh, again, this is inelegant, uh, but I have met with the immediate past president of Ukraine, Poroshenko. He's a chocolate manufacturer originally, but he's a real Democrat, small d. And I think that in the process of democratization, many Ukrainians cast aside a variety of negative attitudes because democracy doesn't really tolerate that. So I'm just giving you a few theories that scholars who look at this um, uh, have said, have put forward, and go over to the Pew Center and you can find uh, data on attitudes to Jews in Eastern Europe today. Malka, you're, you're muted. Hello? You're muted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Simkowicz. Um, this is Nisan Hershkowitz. And um, 
I very much appreciated uh, the, the entire intellectual and emotional presentation. My question is on a bit of uh, scholarship. Um, actually, as the rabbi knows, Moses is mentioned one time in the Haggadah, but I, I, and it's in the context of being the servant of God. It's an obscure reference. Perhaps that- He's not, that, he's not mentioned in the narrative of the Exodus from Egypt. He's mentioned in a song of praise, but not yes, in the narrative. Exactly, and, and perhaps that mention itself uh, um, even um, more than uh, his absence elsewhere um, enlarges the role of God, which is what we're supposed to be thinking exactly. about. We're praising God as the, is there any, my question is, is there any parallel to that in the book of Esther as, as far as any type of um, a mention of, uh, of God in, in a way that would also draw even greater attention to the fact that it was Mordecai and Esther who were the agents of uh, salvation. They had to do it, as you said, with their own wits. There's absolutely no mention of God in the book of Esther. Thank you. It seems to me that there might be a few other comments or questions. Can you all hear me now? I had a little bit yes. of a technological challenge. Okay, great. All right. Are there any other questions, comments, impressions that anybody else would like to share at this time? And unfortunately, I don't see everyone on my screen. So I'm looking from page to page. Any other questions? Um, I, I will ask one more question, then we'll wrap up, uh, Rabbi Popko. I'm curious to know if you're willing to share what has been the Christian reception of your poetry? I understand that you work with uh, media outlets that are Christian, but what about in, in more general sense? What have some interesting or maybe surprising responses have been, or, or maybe even like pushing back or some, you know, something that surprised you in terms of such responses? Well, let me put it this way. Um, when in a country of 9 million people, Israel, when its great poets publish a book of poetry, 20, 30, 40,000 copies are sold in a month. In the United States, when Louise Glick, a country of 30, 335 million people, when Louise Glick, Nobel Prize winner for literature just a few years ago, publishes a book of poetry. She's happy if she sells between 1,500 and 3,000. America is not a country uh, that, uh, that is deeply devoted to poetry like Israel, like Poland, like Russia. And um, therefore, by the way, there really are no real outlets for Jewish themed poetry in America. And so by accident, I met the poetry editor at Christian Century, Jill Baumgartner, and we started, we realized soon that we were both in love with John Donne, um, and which I believe is the poetry that every Western believer in the one God, no matter what religion should read. And so she said, send me some poems. I did. So Christian Century for the past 10 years has been publishing my poetry. And the reception to my Christian theme poetry has been just remarkable from mainline Protestants to Catholics to evangelicals. Um, in fact, um, two of my poems have been incorporated into the liturgy of a few churches. Uh, um, uh, I asked them not to put my name on it. I mean, how does it look? A rabbi is writing liturgy for her for a church service, but I have uh, received nothing but the warmest responses uh, to my Christian theme poetry. Wow. So thank you, thank you for that question. Yes, well, we did receive one last question in the chat and this comes from, well, I don't have the full name, P. McCloskey, who wants to know more about how access and visits to sites of the Shoah have, in your opinion, influenced or maybe not influenced um, attitudes towards Judaism. Um, I, I, and I would maybe, if it's okay, just supplement that question, also attitudes towards the church's role in the Holocaust. But I don't, I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna jump uh, on, on this important question as it stands, so. Uh, the question is, how have visits to the Shoah 
influence, uh, Shaw cites influence changing attitudes towards Judaism? I think this may be something of an exaggeration, but not much. Uh, the, dis the sites of the destruction of European Jewry is one of those rare moments in 2000 years of Jewish history where Jews got to go back to the places in which they were destroyed. Uh, the Jews exiled from the Rhineland in the wake of the Crusades in 1096, and then again in the 12th century and went to Eastern Europe, they never really got to go back. Uh, the Jews are now able to go back to Spain and Portugal, but it's 500 years later. And, um, and uh, these sites have, have made the experience real. And the most devastating experience that I think any person has, a Jew or Christian or Muslim, when they go to uh, see a death camp or uh, the site of a mass murder um, is this. When Virgil takes Dante uh, to hell, he has to go beneath the surface of the earth. What's stunning is that uh, the, the systematic murder of six million Jews, of gypsies, gay persons, political prisoners, resistors, took place here on the face of the earth. Not only did it take place on the face of the earth, it took place in some of the most beautiful places in God's creation. And we, the, we Jews, Christians, and Muslims who believe in the one God, that the one God is the creator, we firmly believe that when you look at the beauty of nature, what you see is the handiwork of God. I mean, that's exactly what God says. If you'll take a look in the Torah, why does God create trees? The first thing God says is because they're beautiful to look at and good to eat. First comes the aesthetic need of the human being, because when the human sees the aesthetics of God, he or she turns heavenward. And here in the midst of all this God-created beauty that is the countryside of Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Poland, forests, rivers, I mean, it's just beautiful. These people went ahead and murdered all these millions of people. And that is shocking because it didn't happen someplace else. It happened here on the face of the earth, uh, which means that in the midst of God's beauty, there are human beings who can choose absolute evil. Uh, let me end this way. Uh, uh, whoever carries the memory of those who have died, and especially those who have been the victims of genocide, is a righteous person. So thank you all for attending this commemoration. Thank you to the Catholic Theological Union, one of a treasure of Chicago and indeed the Jewish community. Thank you to Sister Barbara Reed. Thank you to Professor Malka Simchovich. And of course, to Peter Cunningham without whom none of this happens. And everyone who was on this call uh, should continue to have days, weeks, and months of the good food and, and uh, and, and comfortable shelter and clothing uh, and tranquility uh, here at home. And God bless you all.